Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Belial's Basic Chemical Principles Fiasco. Uh, our friend will not be able to join us to be able to join us today, which means that I am doing this once again solo. She's been pretty good. She has shown up for most of them, but uh, she's not going to be able to make it today. When I started this catastrophe, um, I promised you all that I would cover the same materials that you would get if you took this course in my college class, and I did. Um, we left out a lot of the calculations because, frankly, you're not going to need to know that. Um, I also promised I would teach it the same way that I taught my college course, which is what I've done, which is, well, yeah, kind of close. I mean, honestly, when I teach my college course, I don't usually have a cat on my lap. Say hello, star. My beautiful cat, star. Um, I adopted her. She was a full-grown cat, and she's a black cat. And I did that on purpose because black cats have gotten a bad reputation. They're almost extinct because they used to be hunted down and killed because they were thought to be bad luck. Um, what's more... Kittens get adopted every every day. I mean, I mean, cats get adopted every day, but kittens are easy um, to, to find homes for because kittens are so cute. Full-grown cats, it's kind of hard to, to uh, get homes for full-grown cats. So when I went and I adopted from the Humane Society, I made it a conscious choice to, um, oops, excuse me, uh, adopt a full-grown black cat just because they've gotten such a bad rep, such a bad, bad, uh, yeah. This wasn't fair. Anyway, when I teach my courses, uh, I always put in a couple of buffer days. Uh, these are days in case I fall behind on the syllabus. I know I have them available so I can uh, get through the material anyway. Or if we have a day that I can't come in because I'm sick or uh, snow days, anything like that. Um, I call these special topics because I couldn't just cancel them. Uh, instead, uh, I would have to find something else to teach. So I call them special topics and usually they're applied chemistry. Um, and that's what we're doing today. But today we're gonna have a lot of fun. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, Thursday will be our very last lecture ever. It's also a special topics. Thursday, we are going to talk about that. It's not a toy, sweetheart. That's not for you to play with. Um, Thursday, we're going to talk about my research into the hydrogen bond, um, which uh, should be very interesting. Today, well, hang on a sec. Let me... Today we're going to, okay, where is it? That's not it. There it is. Share this, and of course it's not queued up yet. So I need to do this, and then I need to do that, and then I need to do that, then I need to do that. And here we are, today's lecture. Amuse your friends and all your enemies building your very own atomic warhead. Uh, we're going to talk about how to build the uh, first atomic bombs, and you can do this in your garage. You actually can. Uh, we'll talk about why it's not going to go off, why you're not going to be able to. Well, it's functional. It technically could work if you could get the fuel. And actually, I just told you why you're not going to be able to, to make an actual atomic bomb, because it's easy to make the bomb. The difficult part is getting the fuel that will actually go off. Uh, we talked about that last time. And let's talk about, let's start that. The concept is very simple. In order to make an atomic bomb, what you need, well, let's do it. Actually, it's kind of fun. I, I uh, put this on a discussion um, on my exams. I gave students on the final exam, four or five questions, uh, four or five questions, ask them to choose three to answer. One of them chose sketch an atomic bomb. 
And one of my students wrote this. Here's your bomb. Has nice little fins on it. And a fuse. My student actually wrote fuse. Laughed my butt off. The only thing that was missing, I would have given her full credit for this, except for the fact that she was missing the name of the company. That the uh, coyote would have bought it from. No, this is not an atomic bomb. You're not going to have a lit fuse being flown by an ICBM through space. It's just and it's just ridiculous. It's not. That's not. Uh, it's last time we talked about um, critical mass. Critical mass. Uh, basically, if you have a an atomic bomb core made out of specific isotope, a very specific isotope, I believe it's 234, but I wouldn't swear to it. That's my cat's butt. Um, if you have a, uh, a core that is large enough, every time one of these atoms decay, they give off three neutrons. Critical mass is a mass where the likelihood of a proton is higher or at least equal to hitting another nucleus than it is to hit either a contaminant or to leave the mass altogether. So you have this propagation. Every time, and every time a nucleus decays, it gives off three new neutrons. I always sort of draw them in the same general direction. They're not. They go all over the place. Um, so you get this propagation of decay, basically nuclei falling apart. And let's talk about this for just a minute. Um, Never done that before. We're going to stop share. Actually, you know, could we see what happens? I've never tried this before. So uh, I'm not sure what you're seeing here. So let's stop the share and just restart it. Let's take a look at this. We're calling these iterations in a chain. So the first iteration, you're going to have one. Uh, one nucleus fall apart, and that one nucleus is going to produce three neutrons and a certain amount of energy to go with it. Every time this happens, there's a little energy that's released as well. Now, in the next iteration, there's the possibility of each of these neutrons hitting three more atoms. Oops, let's do this. I guess I kind of forgot to throw this in here. Let's throw in another. All right, fine. All right. A little teeny tiny formula in here. So in our second iteration, We can have up to three more atoms. And now we have nine neutrons all at once. Let's do this. Here's a big hint. I've been using formulas in, in uh, spreadsheets like this for many years. Um, get... I recommend you also learn a database like Access. It's a very different kind of a program. People try to use them interchangeably. Nowadays, Excel seems to be easier, seems that people can catch on more easily. Uh, database is a way of storing large amounts of, of, of data, large amounts of money. 
wish I had a lot amount of money to store in my database. Anyway, um, it's just for storing data, storing, sorting, uh, keeping track of things. You can do it. You can you can make Excel do it, but it's not highly efficient. Um, on the other hand, you can't do calculations in the database. Calculations are done in spreadsheets. But there's also a way, and you should learn how to do this, that you can transfer data from one to the other. I used to do this for my grade book. I used to put all the grades in access, transfer them all into Excel for calculations, and then uh, send the results back. All right, we're working. Then send the results back to access for uh, distribution. But every time you put a little formula in here, don't just assume that you put it in correctly. So go through a step manually. Make sure that you've done it correctly. Once you've done it correctly, you know it's going to do it correctly forever. So now we can take this to 217 iterations, for example, whatever it might be. Access naturally, ooh, that was wrong. Oh, well, that's wrong because of the way I put the formula in. It will be correct. It naturally slows down when you get near the base of the column. And here are the number of neutrons being released as a function of the iteration. And what I want you to notice is how quickly it increases. By the 11th iteration, by the 10th iteration, we're at almost 60,000 neutrons. In 10 iterations, we started with one. Now that's not terribly interesting. Let's take a look at it on the graph. Here's what I want you to really see. Notice the way it jumps up here at the very end. Three iterations, one, two, three. We could say four if you want. And we are off the charts. So all of this energy that's getting released, it actually is being ramped up. You can see that it's being ramped up as you get further and further along. But it's not until the last three or four iterations that so much energy is released. Uh, uh, um, actually, we can, we can do that calculation as well. Are we still recording something weird just happened? So if we take the sum total of the energy released, and do a percentage. Percentage is always times 100. Why am I getting off track here? Sixty seven percent of the energy is released in the very last iteration. In the last three, in the last two iterations, we're at almost 90%, 88% is released.
in the last four iterations, 99% in this cascade effect, 99% of all that energy is released in the last three iterations, last four, last four iterations. These happen in picoseconds. And that's really the difference between an explosion and a fire. If you take, and a lot of people don't know the difference. If you take a barrel full of gasoline and you light it on fire, it's not gonna explode. The reaction occurs at the surface where oxygen can reach the gasoline and you'll end up with a barrel full of burning gasoline. And if you let that gasoline burn all the way down, there's a certain amount of energy that's released. Now, take that same gasoline and add an oxidizing agent to it. This is how bombs are made by terrorists. Don't do this because you're not a terrorist. But if you add an oxidizing agent, that's kind of like adding as if, it's almost as if you've added oxygen throughout the entire barrel. Light it on fire again, and all of that gasoline will burn poof, at once, instantly. You get the exact same amount of energy out of it. So what's the difference between an explosion and a fire? It's how quickly that energy is released. In an explosion, that energy is released very quickly, creating shock waves, and it's the shock wave that really does the damage. Um, it's the same way with atomic bombs. In the last three iterations, most of that energy is released. Okay, I am still recording. We are good. So how do you make an atomic bomb? Well, if you haven't figured it out yet, it's a pretty simple thing. Here's how you do it. Oh, I just messed up my... Oh, I hope you didn't see that password. Probably did. Okay. To make an atomic bomb, you start off with two masses, not one, but two masses of your fuel, uranium or plutonium. Now, in the original atomic bombs, one was shaped like a donut, The other was shaped like a plug. The plug was attached to a plunger with some kind of a force that will plunge this plug into the donut hole. They probably used a, an explosive device. They probably used a little bomb, little little explosive force that would push the donut. I'm sorry, that would push the plug into the donut. But for the sake of our illustration, we're going to say that there's a spring as we're doing this Acme style with some sort of a timing mechanism. So actually, if we did this. So maybe we have a little stick of TNT here. The TNT is gonna be hooked up to the detonator. In the bomb, it was probably an atmospheric controlled explosion. Now here's the thing, if you want to blow up a city, you have three choices. We can wait until the bomb is partway in the ground, or we can wait until the bomb is on the ground, or we can explode the bomb in the atmosphere above the ground. If you hear about the new bunker buster bombs that the US has developed, we'll talk about that here in the second half of the lecture. Those actually are designed to go into the ground, they burrow themselves. They just use the force of the fall 
I don't think there's anything special. I think they just drop it from a certain height so that it goes a certain amount into the ground. Uh, so it doesn't actually explode until it's underground and then most of the force is contained. But shock waves go through the ground, which destroys any structures, any bunkers, anything that happens to be under the ground. So those are designed to go off, uh, not, not really underground, but, but not far. Yeah under the surface of the earth not not no, really far really far now what about exploding it on the surface versus exploding it above the surface most atomic bombs are exploded above the surface because when it explodes on the surface you have your forces going up this way and they're going to hit a lot of resistance they're going to hit hills, they're going to hit houses, they're going to hit all kinds of things. So if you explode it above the ground, there's nothing to resist the force. As, it ex as the force of the explosion goes down and out. So you can get a much wider area of destruction by exploding these bombs above the ground, but still in the air, we're talking a few hundred feet, as opposed to actually hitting the ground. So they don't actually hit the ground with the water. They, uh, and actually, if you watch, if you carefully watch, uh, you carefully watch uh, uh, a video of the old atomic tests, you'll see that it actually kind of floofs out at the bottom. And you can, of course, you get your mushroom cloud on top, but it floofs out at the bottom. That's because it was exploded above. above the ground. Now, our detonator could be a timer. Um, you have to have a little battery in here in order to hook it up. So it could be a timer, it could be uh, height sensitive, something like that. But basically it just sends an electrical charge to the TNT. This charge plugs, uh, forces that plug to go boom into the donut. And all of a sudden these two sub critical mass uh, pieces becomes critical mass. And once they become critical mass, once they become critical mass, they explode. Could you do that in a garage? Of course you could, trivial. Will it ever actually go off? No. Here's the piece that's missing. There used to be an old television show called MacGyver, where MacGyver would, would figure out how to make things on his way. And, and uh, they always left something out. They always left a detail out. Um, so if you tried to make any of this at home, it never worked. Um, I should go back and rewatch that now, knowing what I know. Maybe I can figure that out. Of course, I wouldn't try it anyway, because I'm not a terrorist. FBI. But the problem here is not building the bomb. The bomb is easy. You can do this. The problem is, first of all, there's details that the government's not letting out. The government won't tell us exactly what critical mass is. They did the calculations. They know. Um, we don't. Second thing is, the hard part is getting the purified uranium. We talked about la that last time. Getting uranium is easy. Purifying out the specific isotope that you want requires such sophisticated equipment. Basically, it's, it's centrifuges, but not just the centrifuge. I, I can buy a centrifuge and in, in, I can order it from Amazon. But the centrifuges they use are very sophisticated. They are huge. Um, interesting. They're very large. Um, they're, they're not simple centrifuges, um, which is why it takes the resources of the government to actually purify the fuel enough to make an atomic bomb. This is not how atomic bombs are made today. Today, you make 
fission, fusion, fission warheads. Okay. Fission, fusion, fission, uh, nuclear warheads. This is uh, this is the difference between the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb, or nuclear bomb. Some people think that the hydrogen bomb is just hydrogen. You light it on fire, it explodes. No, that's a chemical bomb. Yes, it'll explode. I mean, if it's mixed with oxygen, that'll explode. But that's not what a hydrogen bomb is, because that's just an that's just a chemical bomb. Bomb that has you know. Here's how we no longer work with critical mass. Modern bombs now work with critical density. critical density, which means suppose you have a, a mass, let me get a circle, with so many atoms in it, subcritical mass. Now we're gonna compress it so that the volume is smaller, but we have the same number of atoms, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those atoms get closer because we've compressed our mass. So the odds of a neutron escaping harmlessly actually reduces. It becomes more likely to hit another atom rather than just simply leave because all those atoms are now closer together. So we have the same thing. We still have, and like I say, this happens in picoseconds. This is, you know, less than the blink of an eye. This is a fraction of a twitch. Um, it's a millionth of a twitch. So <clears throat> if we use critical density instead of critical mass, it becomes very different. So here's how we do it. We're going to take our fuel our atomic bomb fuel, uranium or plutonium or whatever it happens to be. And now we have to be careful because now we're going to surround it with explosives. These are not any explosives. If you take a stick of dynamite, it's going to explode that uranium. Explode means it's just, just going to and get spread out. That's called a dirty bomb. Now you're just spreading out nuclear material, radioactive material. It's going <clears> to <throat> irradiate a large. It's going to irradiate a large area, so it's not useful. But it's it's just radioactive. It's not really going to explode. I mean, you'll get the explosion from the dynamite. So they actually have, believe it or not, two types of explosives. They have fast explosives and they have slow explosives. So they very carefully designed this explosive sheath around the uranium so that instead of exploding, it implodes. It forces that uranium or plutonium, whatever your fuel is, to go and become compressed extremely compressed. Now this is, these explosives that they put around this, this is kind of like plastic explosive. This is, this, these are the explosives developed by the military. If you, Take one of these plastic explosives, you could blow up a city block with it. Give that over a little bit. You could explode a city block with it. That's kind of cool, huh? 
Of course, we're men. What kind of man would be satisfied with blowing up a city block? So when we set off our uranium, or plutonium, that uranium or plutonium is going to get compressed to critical density just for a split second. But in that split second, it's enough time to set off the atomic blast. This is a fission bomb. That fission explosion is what we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And many thanks to the to Japan, they were unwilling participants. Uh, but we got to see the devastation caused by these bombs. And it's been suggested, this is why we've not been in an atomic exchange, um, because we saw that devastation. George W. Bush was the first president to not see firsthand um, that devastation of the atomic bomb, which a lot of people, it made them really nervous. Um, and since then, we've been loosening up all kinds of things for a while. We were, well, let's talk about that in a second. So now we have an atomic explosion. With an atomic explosion, we're not blowing up a city block. We're blowing up the entire downtown of the city. That's not enough. Who wants just to blow up the downtown? We need more power. Arr, arr, arr. So we have a second fuel source. This would be deuterium or tritium. This is your hydrogen component of a hydrogen bomb. If we compress this hydrogen enough so that we can overcome, remember we talked about the Coulombic force, forces that's preventing fusion from occurring. If we press these hydrogen atoms enough to force the nuclei together, we're going to have a fusion bomb. So we're going to put a plunger here. inside a steel case, a very tough steel case to hold it all together. And if we compress that hydrogen enough, now we have a fission bomb. So we have our chemical bomb, we have our fusion bomb, we have our fission bomb. Fusion, fission, F uh, fission, fusion. Now here's the thing, this would be enough to wipe out the entire city, not just downtown, but we're talking the entire city is now gone. That's not enough. We want more. The problem with this, in a fusion reaction, a lot of the energy is released as heat as opposed to shock wave. Um, and that dissipates fairly quickly. We want a bigger boom than that. We want to take out all of the suburbs, all the little outlying cities as well, all the townships around the city. We want to take out it. We don't want to take it all out. Arr, 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 arr. So how do you do that? Well, it turns out if you have even low-grade uranium, you put enough energy into this, and even the low-grade uranium is going to go off as a fusion, as a fission bomb. So the energy released by this fission bomb will be enough to set off fusion, a fusion reaction in low-grade uranium. So you take this entire warhead, wrap it up in more uranium. Now you have a fusion, I'm sorry, fission, getting my words mixed up. Fusion, fission bomb, warhead. Fission, fusion, fission. We've now thrown enough atomic and nuclear power at that city that we're going to wipe it out 
Are we still recording? Yes, we are. That we can wipe it out. One more hit. All done. When I was a kid. Nowadays, and I don't know which is worse, honestly, uh, because it never happened. We used to have these drills, just like they have drills today. And this is pathetic, by the way. Uh, anybody who actually goes into a school and shoots it up, they're lacking. There's there's nothing honorable about it. There There's nothing courageous about going into a school and killing kids. It's stupid. Um, and, and the worst punishment for these people is not enough. But they're cowards. They're simple cowards. That's all there is to it. When I was a kid, we didn't worry about school shooters, but we did worry about atomic, an atomic exchange. Uh, ICBMs were just being developed, which means that some idiot, well, over and right back then it was the Soviet Union that was the biggest threat, um, could push the button and all of a sudden there's a bomb in our backyard. So we used to go through drills in schools, not for shooters, not for someone coming in, but for the atomic bomb, for a nuclear exchange. And we'd all have to get under our desk and pull our knees up to our chest and cover our heads. And uh, of course, we always had to co go under our own desks so that when they find our bodies, they know who they are. It's a scary world. Um, there is no way to get rid of atomic weapons. The technology is, no, is known, it's out there, it's done. Somebody will always have atomic weapons. Um, the policies got a little out of control for a while. During the height of the Cold War, the US had <clears throat> enough warheads to be able to wipe out the entire world, I mean, obliterate, just destroy the entire world, something like 12 times over, 10, 12 times over. Seems like if you can destroy the entire world once, it should be enough. But it wasn't. And things got out of control. They were just ridiculous. Today, well, I don't know if it's still true. Because that was the height of the arms race. And unfortunately, the arms race has reignited. Um, I don't think it's it's not nearly the intensity it used to be. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about how we came back from the brink. Uh, not entirely. We're still pretty close to that ledge. I... Uh, I used to work in New York City at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, which was a skyscraper. It was a huge building, 30, 40 stories to this, to this building. You can look it up. I don't know the exact number. But I did go on the roof once. Um, amazing view. You're not supposed to be up there. Don't tell them I went up there. But it's an amazing view. But it's always windy because you're so high. It's always cold. Um, And if you walk up to the edge, it's, I don't care which edge you go, it is scary as hell because you're right there on the edge. I didn't go up there to jump. I went up there because I was curious. I wanted to see what the city looked like. But, and I walked up to the edge. I didn't even get on the little rounded, exact it, but I walked to it. Uh, and nope, I had to take a few steps back because I was right there on the edge. We are right there on the edge today. We have stepped back a few steps, but we are still, and we will always be right there. And we're going to talk a little bit about the politics of this after our break. So I'm going to take five minutes. I will see you soon. Are we ready? Okay. So, here we are on the edge. John F. Kennedy has a decision to make. The Russians are shipping missiles to Cuba. 
the great Cuban Missile Crisis. If you do not know what the Cuban Missile Crisis is, I recommend that you go and you take a look at, uh, actually, they made a movie about it. We were right on the edge, man. We were closer to nuclear exchange than people realize. Um, Kennedy found a way to hold off and negotiate his way out of it. Thankfully, or we would not be here today to talk about this. When the Soviet Union, well, during the Cold War, the, the whole point of the Cold War was to bristle our, it was saber rattling. Uh, Khrushchev at one point made the comment that missiles were coming out of uh, Russian factories like sausages. Uh, they were just producing missile after missile after missile. Um, So, of course, we had to do the same. And it became ridiculous. Um, MIT did a study once and came to the conclusion that if the Soviet Union launched an estimated 10% of their nuclear arsenal and hit key cities, port cities in the U.S., then 100 years after the attack, the U.S. economy would still only be 10, I'm um, sorry, 50% of the pre-attack gross domestic product. And that's assuming the best possible condition, meaning that people don't riot and overthrow the government. Um, we would be destroyed economically. There'd be a lot of survivors. So we're not talking total devastation, but economically the US would be gone. So why do we need all those missiles? And yes, there's gonna be a, some politicizing here, but we're gonna talk about uh, technology as well. Um, when the Soviet Union fell apart, and I mentioned this in a previous class, um, there was a small public uh, Russian Republic that broke away became one of the world's nuclear powers because when the Soviet Union pulled their troops out, they left all those nuclear warheads behind. Kazakhstan. Um, today, we don't need to worry about it. First of all, Kazakhstan did reach out to the international community and ask for help in uh, dismantling all those weapons. But when the Soviet Union, and by the way, it was um, it was the Star Wars initiative here in the U.S. that caused the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, the U.S. had a very strong economy and could afford all of the crap that we were doing. The Soviet Union was right on the edge. And when Reagan came out and said, we're gonna develop a missile defense space-based missile defense shield, the Soviet Union had no choice but to respond in kind. So they started their missile defense uh, research. And it was too much for the economy and their entire economy collapsed. It collapsed so quickly that there was a cosmonaut on the Russian space station at the time, they could not afford to bring him back down Think about that. All the equipment that they need was already up there, and they still didn't have enough money to just bring him back to the Earth. It took several months before they could actually scrape together the resources uh, for another landing. Um, and when the country, when the Soviet Union started falling apart, and countries like Kazakhstan began getting the, the, the nuclear missiles. Now, of course, they didn't have the launch codes. It became pretty clear that we needed to stop the Cold War in very quickly. And there was a sudden and dramatic reduction. The United States said, you know what? We're getting rid of 
a certain percentage, we're getting rid of, it was more than half. I'm thinking like 60, 65%. We're just getting rid of it. You do the same in the Soviet Union and say, okay, we're getting rid of ours too. Not all of them, most of them. And there was just this detente. Ah, get rid of it. We don't need it. It's too much anyway. It already destroyed the Soviet Union's economy. Why do they want to hold on to that crap? And as I mentioned last time, because of nuclear reactions, that uranium or plutonium or whatever that core is, it's decomposing, it's creating its own contaminants over time. Those cores have to repl be replaced approximately every five years where there's a 50% chance that they won't even go off. Actually, I think it's after 10 years, there's a 50% chance they won't go off. Yes, I know. So. It was expensive. It's expensive to keep these weapons. There's just no two ways about it. Um, now that those cores could be broken down to, to basically form uh, the outside of the bones. Are we recording? Yes, we are. But all of a sudden it became clear to us to both sides that Things were out of control. It was time. It was time to come back a little bit from the precipice, which gave rise to the salt treaties. Okay. The salt treaties. Uh, the salt treaties. No, I'm not even quite sure what those stand for. The longest one, the, the one that uh, was in effect most recently was the SALT II Treaty. Trying to write over a cat now. She's making it hard. Ah. Okay, SALT II Treaty. Now, here's what the SALT II Treaty did. There were several parts of it. There are parts of it I'm sure that I do not know. Um, Basically, this is self-assured mutual destruction. Um, that's not what SALT stands for, but that was the concept. We're going to keep enough weapons so if you launch on us, even by surprise, there will be enough weapons left behind to completely decimate you as well. So yeah, we're going to kill each other if either one of us launches. And that was part of it. First of all, it limited the number of warheads. There were only, I think, 600 warheads we were allowed to have, something like that. So we had a limit to the number of warheads we could do, we could make. Now, <clears throat> people who love war find ways around things like this. The politician said, look, we can only have 600. No, not warheads, not warheads. I'm sorry, that's wrong, that's wrong. Limited number of delivery vehicles. We can make all of the warheads we wanted. But limited delivery vehicles. That means a limited number of ICBMs, of missiles. By the way, that in and of itself is a real trick. It takes a lot of technology to make a, a missile it can actually go intercontinental. More and more countries are becoming capable of doing this. The Apollo moon mission. The Apollo moon mission was a military exercise. How do you convince people to spend millions of dollars, billions of dollars, to destroy another country. The Soviet Union was the first country to put up a satellite in Sputnik. They launched Sputnik into orbit, and that was a message to the United States president. When they launched Sputnik, what they were saying is, we've launched a satellite the approximate size and weight of a nuclear warhead into space. And if we can launch it into space, we can drop it in your backyard. 
The United States had no choice but to respond. Fortunately, NASA had a lot of ex-Nazi scientists. <laughs> yes, that's actually true. A lot of our rocket scientists were former Nazi scientists. So that's where the V-1 rocket came from in World War II. Uh, anyway, the United States, John F. Kennedy made a lovely speech where he said, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. It became the moon race. And all of a sudden, the United States and Russia are in a brand new race, but this time, the United States is trying to develop rockets capable of doing the same thing that the Soviet Union did when they launched Sputnik. They are trying to develop a missile capable of launching a nuclear warhead and landing it in the backyard of the Kremlin. So NASA was developed, actually, to develop ICBMs. The technology is now still in use today. Smaller countries like North Korea trying very hard to develop their own ICBMs, finding it difficult because the technology is not trivial. The reality is, if the United States is ever attacked by a rogue nation, they're not going to be delivering it a, a nuclear warhead by ICBM. They're going to float it into one of our harbors in a ship. Probably a ship with a crew who has no idea what they're doing. Most likely. But anyway, now all of a sudden we have a limited number of delivery vehicles. So how do you get 400 missiles, uh, 400 warheads on 600, uh, 4,000 warheads on 600 missiles. Well, all of a sudden, now you have a multi-warhead developed cruise missile. That's what cruise missiles were made for. Each cruise missile could hold five or six nuclear warheads. And they were designed to fly to a target, pop off one of the warheads. Fly to the next target, pop off another warhead. Fly to the third target, pop off another warhead. So that's where these multi-warhead cruise missiles came from. That's why they were developed. Is it better? Eh, a little bit better. At least every time they're approaching or over a target, there's a probability it, that they'll be shot down. But it was something. The second thing that the SALT II Treaty did was stop all atomic weapon research. All of a sudden, both days, every nation that, that signed the SALT II Treaty agreed no more tests of atomic bombs. When he got into office, one of the first things President Trump did was he walked away from the SALT II Treaty. I'm not a fan of, of, of uh, um, Trump. I apologize for those who are. But he had a habit of trying to get out of things with a promise of replacing it with something better. And I wish he had. But Historically, he makes these promises and then never comes through with a better part. He just says, we're not doing that anymore. I'll replace it. And he never does. The SALT II Treaty was never replaced. It was just, we walked away from it. The SALT II Treaty, which was signed in the 70s, I think, kept us safe, kept us away from nuclear exchange for almost half a century. And he just said, no, it's no longer valid. The excuse he gave was because there was no way we could detect if nations were setting off, if Russia was doing 
secret underground nuclear test explosions. That's wrong. Since the 60s, we've been able to detect atomic explosions, nuclear, nuclear test explosions, anywhere in the world, whether it's above ground, on ground, or below ground, we could not only pinpoint within a mile, or some less than that, where the explosion was, we could also tell if it was above or on or underground. It would have been underground anyway. Because these are, people don't think about this. These weapons are global weapons. You cannot set off a bomb as powerful as even the old atomic bomb without affecting the entire world. Back before the SALT II Treaty was signed, there was a scientist at Boston College that used to get excited every time he heard about another atomic test explosion. He would put an instrument on the roof of the science building to measure radioactivity in the atmosphere as a function of time. And when they set off a bomb, even in Russia, even halfway around the world, that radioactive counter would peak and then come back down. He was measuring the radioactive fallout cloud, which engulfed the world, even a single warhead, a single warhead set off enough radiation that the radioactive cloud engulfed the entire world. The way the United States can, can, can uh, uh, detect atomic test explosions is with three seismometers. Now they have more than that. They have them spread out throughout the world, but just simple triangulation. You set off a bomb, Somewhere in the world, in a mushroom cloud, and it sets shock waves throughout the entire planet that can be picked up by, su by, by substations. And the amount of time it takes for these substations to detect these shock waves they can triangulate and figure out exactly where that explosion occurred. So yes, we could tell if Russia was violating the SALT II treaty. It was trivial. But I don't know if you noticed this. As soon as we walked away from the SALT II treaty, all of a sudden the U.S. once again, I mean, they immediately, jumped into, within months, testing again. The scientists had developed, I'm sure, the designs for these things. They wanted to try them out. And by God, they were going to do it. This is, this is a small planet. The human, we we have we have engulfed the planet with our species. Um, we are running the resources dry. Uh, today we are starting to see it's not an atomic exchange. It's not the atomic war that's destroying our, our world right now. It's the economic war. When I say the economic war, I'm talking about the war waged by those who want more and more and more. We have lakes and rivers drying up because we're in the midst of a global drought. We have the core, the planet temperature increasing because of greenhouse gases, because of fossil fuels. Sadly, there are always people with degrees 
and I'm very critical of him. Again, I'm going to speak politically here. I apologize if you like this man. Dr. Oz is one of them. Brain surgeon. He has a degree. He worked as a brain surgeon. Turned into a salesman. Because he wanted more and more and more. And he uses scare tactics to sell things. I once heard him, I don't watch Dr. Oz. I was visiting someone, they had him on, or I was at a, maybe I was in a waiting room. I'm not quite sure where I saw it. But he was talking about the dangers of plucking a nose hair because it's bacteria's way of getting right into your brain and killing you. Really? What are the odds? Is this something I need to be afraid of? It's ridiculous. I forget what he was selling, but I'm sure he sold a boatload of it. So back when I was growing up, the big debate was cigarette smoke. Nobody debates it anymore. Does it cause cancer? Doesn't it cause cancer? There were always reports that came out that were published. Cigarette smoking is linked to lung cancer. Doesn't cause it. Does not cause it. You can never say this causes cancer. What it does do is increase the risk of cancer and rather dramatically. So if you smoke, you won't necessarily get cancer. You have a much greater probability that you will. And every time scientists came out and published a paper that said linked to cancer, the tobacco industry would find a, a scientist willing to take their money to report, oh, no, this is a flawed study. Or, well, we did it, but we didn't find a strong link. Maybe something mild, but eh, not significant. These scientists were legitimate scientists. But basically, they were being paid to be mouthpieces, the tobacco industry. Same thing is happening with greenhouse gases. The fossil fuel companies are hiring their mouthpieces to come out and say, well, yeah, the world is warming up, but it's probably just part of a natural cycle. When I look at historical data, of global temperatures, which they can get, by the way, um, fossil records. Uh, if they take ice cores from um, the Antarctic, there are ways to tell the average temperature for a given period of time. You have to be careful with science. I've said this, I, I have a good friend who talk about science frequently. And I've said it time and time again, and she started repeating it back to me. You can never prove anything in science. Global warming is, will not be proved until the very last human alive on earth draws his or her very last breath and says, by God, I guess they were right. You can disprove things in science, but you can never prove. There's always a finite probability that, in fact, it's something else that's causing global warming. There's no proof. You can't prove. So you have to take all of this with a grain of salt. You have to think about who is saying what and what is their motive. Uh, who's paying them? Um, all of these projects, all these research projects, they're being done with grants, grant money. What's the source of that grant money? If that grant money is coming from oil companies, and usually you can't tell immediately, it's usually has some sort of big scientific name, look it up and they will say, oh yeah, this is a conglomeration of fossil fuel industries. Does that mean they're wrong? No, but you have to look at their study with a little more of a critical eye. You have to consider that. 
You have to think for yourself. People are getting a little bit better at questioning medical doctors. And I think this is a good thing to a degree. If the doctor tells you that you need to be on a certain medication for diabetes, um, yeah, you probably do, but it turns out there are alternative ways to treat diabetes through exercise and diet. The problem is nowadays, so many people are saying, no, I don't want to give my money to big pharmaceutical. And over here, there's someone saying, look, I have a natural remedy. Holistic healing. Here's a natural remedy for diabetes. Do they have an actual remedy? Maybe. But it's unlikely because they, too, are biased. They're trying to sell you their products. And the holistic medicine, the alternative medicine industry is a billion dollar a year industry. It's huge. So if you don't want to support the billion dollar a year pharmaceuticals, supporting the billion dollar a year holistic industry, is it better? I don't think so. Because their methods are questionable. The, 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 their proof is usually anecdotal. Look, we gave it to my friend Tom over there, and he's doing fine. He hasn't died yet. He had his diabetes checked, his A1C. Politicians, I kind of got off topic. Not really, though. Politicians will sell you snake oil. They will make claims. We haven't been able to verify if the Soviet Union is doing nuclear testing or not in years. Yeah, we could. That would be easy to find if people looked it up, but they didn't. They fell for it. A lot of fans think we should have gotten rid of the SALT II Treaty. And I agree it should have been replaced. It never was. Now, we cannot be critical, in my humble opinion, of nations like Iran trying to develop nuclear warheads because there's no treaty stopping them anymore. And if we are critical of them, it's hypocritical of us because we're developing new nuclear warheads. The madness is starting again, and it needs to stop. All right, we've gotten off science and onto politics here. I'm not gonna apologize because I don't want you to agree with me. How weird is that? What I wanna do is get you to start thinking about things and making up your own mind. Do you agree we should have gotten rid of the SALT II Treaty? Do you agree with President Trump? Okay, well now I've given you something else to consider. Who's telling the truth? Can you trust me? No. How do you know I'm more trustworthy than President Trump is? I would be ashamed if I told the number of lies that he tells. Sorry, that's a verified fact, whether you like it or not. But Here's the thing, you can actually do your own research. There's a wonderful book by Costa Tsipis, T-S-I-P-I-S, -I -I Costa Tsipis, called Arsenal. Written to be somewhere between a book for people in the business and a book for the general public. So it's readable. It's a little thick at times. A lot of what I talked about today was from that book. You can look this up. You can find other sources. Google, detecting, test, detecting nuclear explosion tests. I don't know, I don't know the exact which, but you'll find that I'm right. So now ask yourself, should we have gotten rid of the SALT II Treaty? Uh, you can look up the details of the SALT II Treaty. 
I mean, there's things that's going to be secret that they're you know, not going to publish. But you can look up those terms of this treaty. And you can see where we were probably a safer and more economically balanced world because of it, because we weren't spending all that money on building more warheads. So it's just something to think about. Thank you for indulging me in my little political spiel. Um, I hope you understand the world of nuclear warheads a little bit better, nuclear weapons. Um, this is what I mean by special topics. Thursday is our very last lecture in this series, unless somebody wants me to do the, sec the, the next semester, which would be organic and biochemistry. Don't know why anybody would if you want to know the truth, but I would be willing to do another semester of this if there was a demand. I don't know that there is. I've not heard anybody say anything about this, aside from my friend who's been attending. Um, so I'm not planning on it. I'd be willing to, but I'm not planning on it. Um, but we do have one more lecture. That lecture is gonna give you insight into the mind of a scientist and how we do research, because I'm gonna talk about a research project that span that started in the 70s, honestly, when I was still in high school. Um, Nah, circa 1980, I guess. Sort of like 40 years, something like that. Um, hydrogen bonding, which seems like such a simple concept and yet is so poorly understood. Um, and I have always had, there's an enigma there. So there's a, there's a problem with a cat that has to clean himself while he's on your chest as you're trying to lecture. Star for crying out loud. Anyway. <laughs> Well, I'm loved, at least by something. Um, anyway, we're going to talk about the hydrogen bomb. We're going to talk about a recent um, epiphany that I had, a recent, I, I, I would call it a breakthrough, but it has not been verified uh, by other researchers, and it probably never will. Um, but we're going to talk about the hydrogen bond and some of the some of the mysteries of science. I taught a physical chemistry science course a couple of years ago, um, thermodynamics. And what I really did intentionally, there's a couple of ways you can teach thermodynamics. One is by going through all of the equations and here's where all this comes from and here's how you use them and here's what you can predict from them, yada, yada, yada. Well, physical chemistry also raises questions. And I decided to approach it. And yes, we did the equations, we did the mathematics, we did the calculations, but we also talked about the ramifications. And I really enjoyed just taking a sledgehammer to the foundations of these students' understanding of science and making them realize that we know very little. <laughs> That's what the hydrogen bond is. It's just people think they know it, but there are just problems with it. And we're going to talk about those problems and my solution to what I found, what I believe to be the answer. We're going to talk about that on Thursday. But for now, I am up here.